Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, so a very warm welcome and thank you for joining this webinar on Germany's last mile initiative, turning vaccines into vaccinations. Um, I'm Inke Fabian de Barreto. I am a member of the German, um, German he Global Health Hub Germany, the steering committee and head of Department of Health and Social Development of GOPA Worldwide Consultants. And as you know, this event is hosted by the Global Health Hub Germany. Um, just to explain a bit what the GHHG is, um, it's a network representing now over 1,500 very diverse members from eight different stakeholder groups. So this makes it a really great platform for discussions concerning global health, and we are very happy to host this panel. Um, maybe you can also check on the website, uh, globalhealthhub.de, where you can find more information. Um, a bit on housekeeping in the beginning. Uh, let me say a few words about that. Um, so as you have maybe seen, um, the event will be recorded so that it can be also watched afterwards on the website of the Global Health Hub. So we kindly ask all participants to mute their microphones, please. Um, and also to deactivate the video function um, because there will be many participants and we have the panelists um, on video. Um, you can participate later on in the discussion by posting your questions or your comments in the chat. And then we will discuss this in the Q&A part, which will come at a later stage. And please, when you put questions or comments, we would be glad if you introduced yourself in the chat put your name, your organization, so that we can also really see who is uh, with us today. Um, another thing, please, we would like you to participate in a, in a short survey via MS Forms, uh, where we just ask you to indicate to which st stakeholder group you belong, because we are tracking a bit also who is with us. I think that's all for housekeeping um, for the moment. I think it's also working. People are still, okay, people are still joining, um, but I would continue um, so that we have enough time for discussion afterwards. So as we know, and we see continuously that the COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting all of us. It's two and a half years now. And um, in Germany and most European countries, COVID-19 vaccination is rather high, but uh, vaccination rates continue to lag behind in many low and middle income countries. And even as we know also in Europe. Uh, while early days of vaccine deployment development were characterized by the insufficient availability of vaccine doses, the challenge lies now somewhere else, namely in turning vaccines into vaccinations. That means um, getting towards the last mile. And under its G7 presidency, um, Germany aims to rapidly increase vaccination coverage and absorption capacity in the global south through a concerted effort and has really taken a lead role there. So the G7 foreign ministers have endorsed an action plan supporting 115 countries with 4 billion US dollars in this initiative. And we want to take this opportunity here to inform about the current status of the implementation of the last mile initi initiative, discuss questions on how to address the challenges we are facing, such as logistical difficulties, weak national health systems, vaccine skepticism, we know also here in Europe, and disinformation, um, which we are going to discuss now in the next, yeah, next one and a half hours. Um, we would first um, like to discuss some key aspects in the next 30 to 35 minutes regarding the last mile initiative and its current status of implementation, as well as lessons learned and challenges, before we then open the floor to the audience. Um, and we really encourage you to send us questions via the chat for the questions and answers. Um, we have uh, the, we have the luck that we have um, our representatives from different ministries here who are really interested to know voices from the ground and how challenges look like um, in the different countries and the settings you are dealing with. So before we get some insights from the field, 
I would like to warmly welcome the initiat initiators of the Last Mile Initiative on behalf of the respective ministries. And there I would like to very much welcome Dr. Günther Sauter. Um, he is the Director General for International Order, the United Nations and Arms Control at the Federal Foreign Office. Um, looking uh, to, towards a career of uh, quite long decades in the Federal Foreign Office in Germany. Um, but he was also a deputy permanent representative of the Republic of Germany to the United Nations recently from 2020 to 2022. Um, and has also spent some time uh, in the embassy of Managua and with EU in Brussels. Um, but uh, very much welcome to you from the uh, Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Um, and then also I would like to welcome Mr. Dirk Meyer. Um, he is the head of the Directorate General One, and the title is quite long. It's Global Health, Employment, Transformation of the Economy, Digital Technologies, Food and Nutrition Security at the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Um, Mr. Meyer has not only headed the office of the member of the European Parliament for his constituency in Germany, but worked also with various ministries in the German federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia before and was recently the Director General at the Ministry for Innovation, Science and Research and then also at the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Safety and now with BMZ. So many thanks for joining us and many thanks to uh, hearing from you about the current status of the initiative. So I would like to first address uh, Dr. Sauter and ask you if you could explain a bit what the Last Mile Initiative is and what role especially the Foreign Office plays in this initiative. Over to you. Thank you. Inke, thank you so much. It's a true pleasure to be discussing this important initiative with all of you. We are happy to exchange thoughts. I'm particularly happy also to listen to the broader discussion that we will be having later on to get input from all of you. Let me start by saying a couple of words on why, as a foreign office, we are supporting and launching the Last Mile Initiative. Well, I believe there are three good reasons for doing that. First of all, this is a tremendously important health issue. Millions of lives have been at stake and continue to be at stake. And I think what we said in the beginning of the pandemic continues to apply. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Then secondly, um, speaking about um, us as diplomats in particular, we believe that under the concept of human security, our job is not only to make sure that states are all right, our job is to make sure that individuals are all right, that they can live their lives under decent conditions, and health is certainly one of these conditions. And then lastly, during the pandemic, we have seen that others are seeing the pandemic under a geopolitical lens. So we have seen vaccine diplomacy, we have seen countries trying to combine their support for other countries, for people all over the world with a certain political messaging, and this is a reality that we have into account in our work to overcome the pandemics. Now, this is why we are doing that. I would also like to say a word on how we are doing it and what we are doing. Well, we thought from the beginning of the pandemic that it's the right thing to follow a multilateral approach and to commit ourselves to making vaccines available to everyone everywhere. This is not just words, this is also deeds. Um, until today, we have supported the Act A initiative with around 3.3 billion euros. We have donated roughly 120 million vaccine doses. We are one of the most important contributors to COVAX, and we are quite proud of it. 
In 2022, this year, the situation changed. Vaccines have become much more widely available, but the vaccine uptake has continued to remain low, in particular in parts of the African continent. So we figured that the most important challenge is no longer to provide vaccines, but to turn vaccines into vaccinations. Um, so this gave us a new focus for our work. We decided we must put more effort into supporting local and national vaccination campaigns, in addition to vaccine donations, which we continue to deliver. Um, we have therefore launched what we call the Last Mile Initiative. This initiative is doing just that. It is supporting all efforts to turn vaccines into vaccinations. We have identified 34 countries in which we are trying to do that together with international and local partners. And as a federal government, we have put um, 850 million euros, roughly 930 million US dollars on the table to do that. We believed from the beginning that it's a good thing to try to lever this initiative. We are currently presiding the G7. So we started discussing with our G7 partners very early this year that it would be good to make the last mile initiative not just a German endeavor, but one shared by many partners. So far, results are um, quite good. As G7, we have provided almost 4 billion US dollars to these and similar efforts. And this translate into, uh, translates into support for 115 countries. Um, the funding for this important initiative is provided by several German ministries. This is a true team effort. I'm very happy to see my friend Dirk Meyer here from the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's foreign office. It's the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development and it's other ministries who join forces here in order to help. So far, um, as Foreign Office, we have been launching and supporting vaccination campaigns in 11 pilot countries, such as, for example, Bangladesh, Somalia, South Africa. We are partnering in many cases with UNICEF and um, our objective here is to rapidly boost the global vaccination coverage and leaving no one behind. Measures include the purchase of cool chain equipment, um, monitoring, training of healthcare workers, but we are also ready and open to take quite unorthodox measures. Let me just give you one example, which I find um, uh, very telling. In uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we have figured out that one of the practical problems is to deliver vaccines to remote villages. So together with our partners in the country, we decided that the best thing to do is to provide um, our partners with motorbikes. So we ended up buying 500 motorbikes in um, Cote d'Ivoire in order to make sure that vaccines can be turned into vaccinations. We came up with the financing of solar fridges in Somalia. Um, we found ways for um, specialists to reach remote areas in Mauritania we also found ways with our partners in Kenya to make sure that these campaigns could go on while other campaigns, I'm speaking about the national election campaigns, could continue. And in South Africa, to give you a last example, we made sure that um, youths in the communities um, launched film screenings and dialogues in order to 
promote the knowledge on how important vaccinations are and what they can do for everybody in order to um, prevent people from contracting COVID. So this is um, what we're doing. This is what we are continuing to work for every day in the framework of the Last Mile Initiative. And this is also why we believe that this is the right thing to do at this point in time. Thanks a lot, Inke. Thank you very much for this really impressive overview. Um, and I think uh, I, it's very interesting to see that also unorthodox measures are being applied really with experts on the ground um, and that you work in partnership and broad partnership. So maybe relating to that, Mr. Meyer, um, what would you say from your perspective from the BMZ, uh, why do we need the last mile initiative and, and what's the role of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development? Thank you. Yes, Inge, thank you very much. Uh, dear Günther, thank you very much for your um, expressions. Um, uh, it's quite clear um, from our perspective too, uh, we want to finish up this pandemic. That's uh, our motivation um, to get right into this uh, initiative. And that's why we as uh, ministerial partners uh, try to um, construct uh, a coherent uh, picture of our initiative from the federal uh, government. Um, as BMZ, of course, uh, dealing with our partners in the Global South, we see that um, this pandemic caused a real disaster also for development policy. We, we saw and we see that uh, so many shadow crises, as we put it, were caused uh, by uh, the pandemic. We see so many troubles and problems um, in uh, economic um, aspects, um, uh, in questions of uh, other health uh, problems we already had and that were uh, accelerated by the pandemic. We see the huge problems in education. We see um, so many problems with sexual rights of women and so on and so on. Uh, all problems um, that are caused by the pandemic and therefore we are really um, dedicated to finish up um, this problem um, to fulfill what Günther just said, that we are all, uh, only safe if everyone is safe. And this is uh, also the, the aspect that um, is relevant for the global south. So therefore, um, the ministries put together all their toolboxes, um, which they uh, had and which they uh, have. And um, um, after all, the, the BMZ last mile contribution is intended to complement the ongoing efforts of uh, UNICEF, of uh, Gavi and others on the ground. And these and other international organizations, organizations such as GFATM and Unit Aid, have received 3.3 billion from the German side through Act A, as uh, Günther already uh, stressed, stressed. As necessary as it is, uh, we react resolutely here. It is also necessary that we prepare ourselves and the world better for future crisis. We try to learn from this crisis. That's why we intend to ensure that the acute last mile measures we are taking now will also help to strengthen health structures in the long uh, term. This is also crucial, uh, coming back to what I said in the beginning, that we saw so many backlashes in development uh, policy, which made the world much more insecure than it was before. And just to round it up, what uh, Günther just mentioned with some of the examples in concrete terms, 100 days after the initiation of our joint last mile initiative, our efforts now show promising progress, though um, COVID-19 vaccination rates continue to lag behind, especially in many low-income countries. We are seeing higher rates in some countries, especially regarding to the 20% threshold. Therefore, it is crucial that we are all coming together today. Thank you very much again for that, to take stock on where we stand and discuss how we can overcome the remaining obstacles. So that's our perspective, that's our dedication, and it's the uh, common dedication of the German government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Meyer. Um, you mentioned what I found, the coherence, and that you put your toolboxes together and really streamline efforts. Um, and when you talk about that, um, that reminds us, that, as you mentioned also, to be prepared for future crises as well, not only ending 
COVID, but also ending other diseases, etc. That that's a great step ahead and a lot of lessons learned. Um, when you talk about, uh, that is all based on partnerships, I understand. So could you just elaborate a bit more? We heard already it's different ministries, it's UNICEF, GFATM, et cetera. But what kinds of partners do you work with? What other actors you are working together? Because also for these more unorthodox measures, you might have also others in mind. Could you elaborate a bit more on that, um, Mr. Meyer? Yes, uh, first of all, um, and that's, that was crucial um, through um, the complete uh, uh, crisis. We built very much on the uh, crisis reaction uh, system uh, of Act A and with the partners uh, in Act A. And um, I mean, um, coming from the BMZ, I saw that, um, especially in the beginning of this crisis, um, there was a lot of, um, uh, uh, unrest or um, even complainment uh, about uh, the behavior of uh, the North, where we, uh, especially uh, in our countries in Europe, uh, we stick to, first of all to uh, cure our own population. And um, um, that's also part of how to learn from a uh, coming crisis. Um, nevertheless, we succeeded with Act A to start um, uh, in humankind history the biggest vaccination campaign uh, ever before. And therefore, uh, we see and saw uh, Act A as um, a very good um, um, a crisis reaction uh, tool um, and platform um, uh, to uh, also to guide us through um, uh, the last mile uh, initiative now. So uh, as Günther already said, we try to um, we, we talk with the countries because we see in all the partner countries that the problems with the last mile are very uh, different. Different. Um, um, there is not just one tool for everybody. Uh, it's the same, actually. I mean, it, it's no surprise because when we look in, in Europe, even if we look in, uh, in special lands of Germany, we see quite different um, uh, tasks we always had to, uh, to, to challenge. Um, in some regions of Germany, people were a bit skeptical about vaccination. In others, they weren't. So we have the situation also in the partner countries. So together with our partners, together with the partners we have in the development policy, we try to figure out where the biggest problems are uh, um, to, to manage um, uh, the last mile and develop um, own roadmaps uh, for that. And uh, we have Act A as the uh, crisis reaction mechanism, and we have uh, the partners to figure out where the, the biggest problems are and find the right ways uh, to deal with the problem. That's our mechanism we have in mind, and that's uh, how we come to get into concrete work uh, on the ground. Over. Thank you. Maybe to ask uh, Dr. Zaut as well. You talked about, yeah, you both talked about, yeah, the challenges, also the threshold of the 20%, et cetera. Could you just tell us a bit, do, do we have a clear overview about what are the main challenges and obstacles for the implementation of this initiative, especially in those countries where the rates are still low? Thank you. Inke, I believe that we have now a pretty precise image of the challenges that we have to overcome. Vaccine hesitancy is one of these challenges. That's a mentality issue in all countries, including mine. Low capacity of health workers is a very significant challenge in many places in which the last mile initiative is active. And other ch challenge that um, we understand is that in many of the health systems that we are cooperating with, COVID-19 has a relatively low priority. The reason for that is obvious. We are here speaking about contexts in which other health challenges are much more significant in terms of the damage that they do. And also in very concrete terms, um, one of the challenges in some of these contexts is that um, the infrastructure to provide for testing, etc., and to provide for statistics, 
that help us um, uh, conduct our work is very basic and this too is something that we have to take into account. We are also dealing with administrations that are weak or that have other priorities and all of that is um, what we need to deal with and this is also why partnerships are so important um, Dirk has just eloquently made that point and I can only um, support it. Um, these partnerships help us understand much better um, what the precise and concrete challenges in any given country context are and find pragmatic solutions to deal with these challenges. Thank you very much for this overview and very concrete challenges mentioned. So we would now be very curious to see uh, what we learn really from implementation on the ground. So make a bit the cross check uh, of what you both said. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, the other panelists to you. So um, I would like to first welcome Ted Scheiban. He is appointed as Global Lead Coordinator for the COVID-19 Vaccine Delivery Partnership also starting from, from February this year onwards. And Ted, you have been looking yeah, to a long career with UNICEF before, and was, you were especially working a lot in emergency settings, uh, for example, in Ethiopia, Sudan, Sri Lanka, Southern Africa, etc. among others also for the Operation Lifeline Sudan. So you, you, yeah, you have, a lot of, um, have a lot of background for this context we are working in at the moment. Um, and then I would like to yeah, introduce Dr. Farah, Dr. Uba Farah Ahmed, sorry. So um, Dr. Ahmed um, is a pediatric neonatologist um, and has more than two decades in managing pediatric and neonatal illnesses. And she is at the moment the director of, family, of the Family Health Department in the Ministry of Health of the Federal Government of Somalia. So we heard already something about Somalia mentioned before, so it will certainly be interesting to know um, how is the situation in your country. Um, and then we have also Kolo Makena with us. Um, Kolo Makena is from South Africa. From the, she is managing director of the Broadway Legacy Foundation in South Africa. And what is very interesting is that she has uh, an IT background and came from IT over to the health sector, leading a lot of studies and now, um, as mentioned, the foundation uh, uh, studies, but also day-to-day -day management um, about several issues about psychosocial support, human rights, um, stigma and discrimination, child health, etc. So this is a very interesting um, panel. So we would like to invite you to tell us a bit what is happening on the ground. And maybe I start with Ted. Um, Ted, can you give us an insight a bit why your position as lead, global lead coordinator for COVID-19 vaccine um, delivery partnership was created and what it really entails in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Inka, and thanks to uh, uh, Germany for all it's doing in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and for this opportunity to address the Global Health uh, Hub Germany on the Last Mile Initiative. Um, 13 billion doses of uh, COVID-19 vaccines have been administered globally but we still have huge inequities. Uh, while 63% of the global population is vaccinated, uh, it falls to 18% in low-income countries and 24% in uh, Africa. So uh, I was appointed and my uh, the, the organization I represent, the Global uh, uh, COVID-19 Vaccine Delivery Partnership was established by WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, the World Bank, and other partners in January of this year uh, to address this inequity uh, and to support the uh, 92 uh, low and lower middle income countries that joined COVAX uh, with COVID-19 vaccination and specifically the 34 countries that were at 10% or less uh, full vaccine coverage uh, in uh, January of uh, this year. Uh, what we do is we work with the 
what we call the one country team at country level. We put countries at the center of the response. So this is the government and partners working with one plan and one budget to support this acceleration. Uh, what does that mean concretely? Uh, I advocate with governments for continued attention um, uh, to COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, we work on uh, 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 getting uh, quick impact funding uh, to countries for uh, vaccination campaigns. Uh, we help align partners, so we work in a unified manner, and we provide uh, technical assistance from vaccine demand and hesitancy issues to strategies to reach the elderly to issues with cold chain and uh, health management information systems. Okay, that's quite a broad role you take and uh, what you are covering. If you look back now, I mean, it's just, well, it's about six months now that you are in charge. What would you say from your point of view, what are your main achievements since taking over your function and what are also the challenges? So if, if you allow me in care, what I'm going to discuss is actually what countries have done. And then, you know, in part, we've supported that progress. And I, I want to make the point that there's been enormous progress since the beginning of the year when vaccines became available in sufficient quantities. And let me just give you a couple of numbers, if you allow. Among the uh, what they call the AMC 92, the low and low, lower middle income countries, uh, that did not have the opportunity to vaccinate their population in 2021. Vaccine coverage has gone from 28% at the beginning of the year to 51% coverage today. That's a huge progress. Uh, you know, across the 34 countries that were at 10% or less full vaccine coverage in uh, January, coverage there has gone from 3% to 17% today. And the number of countries that have uh, that are still below 10% has gone from 34 to 9 with some countries now reaching 30% coverage, uh, you know, fully 15 countries are above 20% coverage. Countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, uh, uh, Tanzania, Zambia have made massive progress since the beginning of the year. So progress is possible when the resources are aligned properly. At the same time, there's definitely continuing challenges, as you said. First, and I'm going to build on what Gunther said here, stretch health systems and poorly paid frontline health workers uh, with many health priorities that they're dealing with. Uh, Omicron has also changed risk perceptions, um, and uh, uh, there is still vaccine hesitancy, specifically in urban settings because of misinformation. Um, and we also need to uh, note that the countries with the lowest vaccine coverage are dealing with major humanitarian uh, emergencies, food insecurity, conflict, governance issues. So really, this highlights the importance of the last mile effort, you know, decentralized community based approaches, focusing uh, on uh, uh, house to house vaccination, uh, uh, supporting those community health workers and working with community and religious leaders uh, to reach the most vulnerable. Yeah, I think that's, that sounds quite good. I like really that you said it's we work with the countries because the countries also have a way of how to shape, you know, the assistance you need. I understand you have a toolbox of different services you can provide and can be asked of so that it's really tailor-made. As we heard also before, you need tailor-made solutions. Um, then, um, then maybe um, I would like to then have uh, Dr. Ahmed um, to contribute because you mentioned already about the yeah the low income and and where the vaccination uptake is rather low. It's mainly also in countries with a humanitarian crisis with a difficult context. And so, um, Dr. Ahmed. Especially also in your country, there's a fragile humanitarian context and vaccine uptake is rather low. So, so speaking from your experience, what do you think works well? What do you see and what are the obstacles in, in a setting like in your country? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Inc. And good afternoon to you all. And I am really uh, great. Um, thanks to, to having me in this panel discussion and talking this really important issue, how to reach the last mile. Uh, let me give you an overview about the Somalia and actually how is our vaccine uptake. Uh, 
Uh, Somalia uh, have re received the first batch of vaccine 15th of March 2021, exactly a year after the first case of COVID-19. Um, and the day after highly level advocacy by vaccinating the minister and the president was started soon. Um, the COVID-19 vaccination rollout is, uh, is supported by the Gavi and uh, the local team of WHO and UNICEF. As, to, as per today, 6 million, 220 million doses of COVID vaccine were administered to Somali people. This translates to 27.7% 27 27 uh, of Somali people are fully vaccinated, while 14% are partially vaccinated. Let's say that approximately 39% of the population have got the vaccination. Uh, for the gender perspective, uh, males are 54%, while the female are 54 46. And also in, in the last year, we had had a gap in equity of vaccinating uh, based on the geographical uh, location. Uh, today, the urban people living in urban setting, 28% uh, of them are vaccinated, while the IDPs, as, as the colleague before me mentioned, we have a, a severe drought, which causes a lot of uh, internal displaced uh, people in a rural area. We vaccinated them 25% of the population as they are high risk of getting COVID-19 and, uh, and, and requesting uh, hospitalization. Also, the rural uh, people was, uh, we reached 17% of them and the nomadic also. Really, the, the government has, with his uh, partners, has did a huge effort on reaching uh, as much as possible. Um, as the first uh, time when we received it on, on exactly 300,000 doses of AstraZeneca, we decided to uh, deliver um, the vaccine on only on urban basis using fixed sites and public health facility and also the private hospital with uh, adequate capacity and experience on providing vaccination. But this uh, strategy wasn't uh, uh, successful and we tried to mix the fixed to uh, campaign basis and really this uh, new strategy on uh, campaign basis has proven has proved to be effectively increasing coverage in various regions. Um, uh, the difficult, as one of the uh, things that you have mentioned, Somalia is uh, uh, one of the fragile country, which uh, decades of conflict and insecure, and some areas are inaccessible. Um, and also now we are facing the, the, the severe drought, which uh, uh, which creates uh, a competitive priorities, uh, as uh, some of you mentioned it. Now we have uh, severely uh, malnutrition in children, women, and uh, and, um, and elderly people. Also, we have some out outbreak diseases like acute urinary diarrhea, cholera in some area, polio, and measles outbreak also reported. These challenges may cause which campaign we have to start fast and which we have to uh, prioritize. Um, and also the, the, the storage capacity of Somali country, uh, our national cold chain is in Nairobi, which causes a stock out of some routine vaccination and not only COVID-19. And we uh, really, with the support of the uh, Gavi and other also German uh, fund, we are trying to expand our cold chain capacity. And also the human resource, while our team has the same, they, they have to face the, the routine immunization, responding to outbreaks, and other side, they have also to think about the COVID-19 vaccination. WHO and units have reported a gap of 60% of the human resource. This is the challenge what now the, the, the government of Somalia are facing, but compared to last year where the, the, uh, the, the, the supplies were shorter, we didn't we couldn't reach the high uh, vaccination rate but but this year however all the difficulties we are uh, we are close to achieve 40 uh, percent of the our target uh, by the end of the year over to you Inc and thank you
Oh, that, that was a very interesting insight in the, yeah, into the achievements you have reached and the challenges you are also facing. I got quite impressed by the, you said, a rate of 60% of lack of health personnel. Just a short question. So you mentioned campaigns, like targeted campaigns. Um, was that mainly done through then, through a sort of a communities or what was your main vehicle there? Or was it more NGOs uh, or partners like UNICEF, Gavi, et cetera, to reach uh, the last mile? Um, but by campaign, I mean outreach campaign where we go to house to house, we go to the offices, we go to the schools, we go to, to the universities, we go to the government offices and we vaccine, we take the vaccine close to the people. This, uh, this really have changed the, 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 the coverage uh, of uh, our vaccination. We utilize it, train a team uh, like a nurse, uh, and also medicine students, some community, and sometimes also polio asset. We don't have to forget that Somalia, we have polio asset. Uh, they are huge human resources capable to deliver, and we used to use them in polio campaign and missiles campaign. Also in some way, we, we use them to increase the coverage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's very interesting to hear. Um, maybe I can also ask Kula Makena, um, and yeah, you talked already about campaigns in Somalia and you um, you are, as part of your work, you are very engaged in awareness campaigns in South Africa. Um, and we had already mentioned also that there is a lot of hesitation and misinformation around vaccines. So how do you, from your side, ensure that these awareness campaigns really, really reach those who are currently unvaccinated? Uh, over to you. Okay. Greetings, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we, there is a lot of uh, gap <laughs> that has been created. We know with the misinformation um, regarding COVID-19 vaccine, but through campaigns, through dot-to-door uh, -door visits, um, having uh, strategic meetings, consultation meetings with the relevant stakeholders, the NPOs, uh, the non-profit organizations in various communities, uh, traditional leaders, traditional healers, and also other departments that are situated within the communities that we are trying to reach. So we initially have a meeting to brief them about the rollout and what it entails, and also that we will require champions within the communities, meaning we get young people to actually campaign, go door to door and introduce the program before we come to a community to vaccinate. So we do the outreach, the awareness campaign within schools as well. So in case uh, we, we have experienced challenges where you find community leaders are hesitant so we had to go through school governing bodies and we started vaccinating at the schools. With the school's permission, that's when they uh, start inviting communities to come vaccinate at the schools, meaning the, the vaccination point becomes the school. So we've had a lot of challenges then and there, but through the engagement and um, consultative meetings with various community leaders, we are able to reach um, the hard to reach communities meaning you know, undocumented uh, foreigners, undocumented South Africans that are within, you know, working at the farms. Um, we've got uh, an opportunity to actually vaccinate also in the farms as well. Okay, so we see Thank here you. also that, yeah, everything, outreach and targeted campaigns, etc., it needs to be tailor-made and you need, yeah, also a lot of, yeah, human resources to cover this. Um, maybe Ted, what are, apart from that, what are logistical obstacles you've seen in the last mile initiative and what have you, what do you have to contribute to overcome these logistic uh, challenges? Thanks, Ika. If I can, I mean, there are a number of things that need to be lined up for a successful campaign. One is the whole issue of uh, strong micro planning, get very specific in your planning. The issue of logistics and looking at the issue of mobile teams because of all the outreach that our colleagues from Somalia and South Africa have spoken about. Think of teams on buses, motorcycles, donkeys sometimes uh, to access remote and underserved areas. Um, the whole issue of a decentralized cold chain 
uh, and a health management information system that we want to see digitalized to the extent possible. Tablets with health workers to gather the information. Um, the whole issue of vaccine demand and vaccine hesitancy. So the importance of uh, community conversations, you know, sitting down with community leaders, religious leaders, and having a discussion about how to have a dialogue with community on vaccination and getting the right information out there. And then very important, arguably the biggest cost driver of campaigns is the whole issue of incentives for vaccinators, enumerators, cold chain technicians, and logisticians. You need to line all of that up uh, in order to be uh, successful. Uh, that's what the Last Mile Initiative is supporting through the partners that have been uh, uh, highlighted by, by Gunter and Dirk. And that is what we're doing as, as a partnership. We're, we're able to provide, so, so far we've provided over 100 million of quick impact funding precisely to cover these kind of uh, uh, campaign costs. And it's important that we do so, especially in humanitarian environments. Uh, you know, in, in those places, if we could have a, a package of activities that focus on COVID-19 vaccination, childhood immunization, screening of uh, and treatment of malnutrition, uh, as Dr. Farah has said, uh, and, and get that bundle out there to communities and, and those that are most vulnerable through not just government channels, but NGOs and CSOs working with government channels. Uh, I think that's one of the next next steps that we need to intensify. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, we heard already. OK, so it's it's a complex system. You need different things. Um, Dr. Farah Ahmed, you have already mentioned the, the lack of trained healthcare workers um, in your country. So um, and you, Ted, you mentioned a bit the different the different uh, yeah, contributions you can do um, with your organization. So uh, Dr. Farah, um, how does the last mile initiative has achieved yeah to mitigate your lack of human resources what, what has happened has there been um, any specific output um, you could mention here uh, thank you thank you so much we are uh, engaging IOM uh, as a partner to provide uh, vaccination uh, basic health services to the nomadic people and cross-border and also save the children in integrating routine immunization with the COVID vaccination and, uh, and having more mobile uh, outreach. And as the Dr. Ted said, we can't uh, only provide COVID vaccination. We have to integrate and give uh, these people in, in need basic health services while uh, screening, uh, treatment, uh, malnutrition, uh, tr food treatment, and um, uh, maybe ANC, some treatment package of uh, diarrhea and pneumonia. Uh, we, we deployed community health workers and also family health workers, uh, thanks to support of the World Bank, to uh, give them a package of, uh, uh, of treatment for the mother and child. And also integrating all these things, the COVID-19, routine immunization, and basic health service, it will be the, 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 the successful package, I think, for, for arriving to the last mile and the people in need. Uh, and also engaging this uh, not traditional partner in this campaign. I, I, we, we have to conclude soon uh, this proposal with I am and Save the Children. Over, the, over, over to you, Inkan. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's really, it seems that it's really impressive that it could give a direct, yeah, win, quick win, as you mentioned uh, before, Ted. Um, what, what I wanted to ask is, it, and it's a question to you, uh, Dr. Fada, and also to you, Kolo Makena. It's about, we talked also about sustainability of the health system. I mean, there are emergency contexts, um, difficult contexts, but in the end, um, it's also about national health systems. And I think, um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Meyer and Dr. Zauter, you both mentioned also the, the system strengthening which is needed because there's a lack of, of strong health systems in general. So how do you see this? Do you see any positive side effects um, by the last mile initiative towards this? Maybe first uh, Dr. Farah and then please Kolo Makena. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, as uh, you know, Somalia, uh, we say it as a part of a fragile country with a weak health system, but we have uh, uh, essential package of health services. This is the flagship of the service delivery in Somalia, where we are asking uh, we, uh, our partners and we soon 
start to implement the Malafimad uh, World Bank project to cover and give the basic health services to five regions and also FCDO UK country uh, are giving maybe they recover other 10 regions in the country for better life. And uh, Germany also this uh, to, to arrive the last mile. If we don't build the, our primary health care, the system will not be in place and every shock and stress will collapse again. We need, uh, even in humanitarian side, we know it's chronic humanitarian in, in, exists in Somalia, but we need uh, even them to, to think some development think that they have to leave for the country. If they come and assist and give the emergency need and leave, the system will be the same and ever and over again. But if we build the primary health care where we, the system can deliver a basic health services that's already in our uh, essential package of health services and also um, Somali health, sec health sector strategy plan and national development plan, if all our partners, our supporters, our implementer plan will align with the, the country uh, policy and strategy, I think we can arrive uh, far and we can have a resilient health system, especially in primary health care. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's very true. And I think also global the global health community has understood and has put a focus more on primary health care. But um, of course, for Somalia, it's still some way to go. Um, how does it look like for South Africa, Kulumakena? How would you judge the situation with a uh, side effect to the health system? Thank you. Um, thank you. You know, with this uh, last mile initiative, it has actually given us uh, an opportunity to go into the deep rural areas of South Africa. We realize that people have to drive or even higher transport to get basic health services, which is about 80 kilometers or 40 kilometers away from their homes. So as we were doing this door to door campaigns, people were expecting a fully packaged uh, service they will ask about HIV testing, they will ask about immunization, you know, but we were bringing only the COVID vaccine. So it really shows that there is a need, there is a lack in our communities and people have lost so much trust in uh, our health services. So I believe this is a point where government and other entities, we come together and see how we bring the services to the marginalized communities, because these are basic human services that are needed. You know, when somebody has to struggle to get a child to the hospital because there is no ambulance services available. So as we were going into these communities, they were raising such challenges that they feel like they are not part of the country. They are socially excluded. So they feel neglected and they feel that they should be addressed because it looks like we come to them when we want to bring a vaccine, but the basic services we are not bringing to them. So I uh, plea with organizations to say, let us find a way on how to address this need. There are going to be future health challenges, but we need to make a comprehensive cover that we go to the communities with it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, yeah, for this plea to you also. And I see Mr. Maya nodding. Um, that's it's very good that you hear because I know we know that BMZ is at the moment finalizing their yeah their health strategy, um, and uh, that there is still also maybe just to, to highlight it here, there is still the opportunity to online also bring forward arguments and comment on it. So I invite really everybody to take advantage of that. And yeah, to I think we all have the chance to shape a bit of this of this new strategy in the in the years to come. So we are very curious about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so so thanks for for those two. I think we are all yeah we are all nodding um, about the things you mentioned. Um, I don't know if Mr. Meyer, you want to you want to react on this because you were quite yeah attentive to the arguments. I, I would like, but for, before I sh uh, uh, close my door, my my window, there was a, uh, there was an ambulance outside. Sorry about that. No, thank thank you very much. That was very very interesting um, uh, for me. Um, for for three aspects, uh, I would like to to underline again. The first is 
um, that we saw that um, nobody from um, a far uh, table would have been able to design the last mile. Uh, we see that uh, no tailor-made uh, solutions um, 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 were able to be constructed uh, on a, a far um, a table. We need um, uh, the competence, the knowledge, the uh, the expertise um, from the ground uh, to design. And and uh, I heard so many agile topics, um, an agile mix of new campaigns which was very interesting for me uh, to listen to. And therefore, it was crucial, and it is crucial, to have um, um, the, the construction of multilateral uh, financing on the one hand, but uh, partner-orientated um, design uh, on, on the ground. ground. Um, second, um, the, the targeting um, uh, aspects. Um, actually, that's, uh, that's a thing where even um, the whole world could learn from. This micro-planning, this way of uh, figuring out which kind of person on the ground is able to communicate what we would like to have and uh, uh, to reach them, uh, to get them on board, to align them. That's also very interesting. And uh, sometimes uh, when I heard that, I wish that we had this expertise during our campaigns um, uh, during uh, COVID. And the third, of course, uh, to see that this spillover aspects and learning for uh, resilient health and social security systems is crucial for the very next future. That's very, very important also for the policy of the BMZ, but, but also for, for the policy of um, um, my colleague, uh, um, uh, Günther Sauter, to, to see how crucial long-term working security systems uh, are. And uh, it's, it's, again, this old knowledge that primary health care is crucial for well-being. And uh, this, this makes world safer and secure. And it also shows, and that's my hope, that by this campaigning, also the ownership for a primary health care system is being taken by the national governments. Um, I mean, uh, any kind of resilient systems means that we have multilateral um, donors and structures on the one hand, but we also need the ownership in the countries and in the governments. And if this last mile initiative actually helps to create this kind of ownership, then we can also say that this last mile initiative makes a bit more progress. So therefore, you see that I'm quite not just dedicated, but fleshed even by this, uh, by this information. And thank you very much uh, to listen to them already. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that sounds quite enthusiastic. So you also bring something back to your to your ministry. Um, I also yeah, I wanted to underline also, as we've seen, maybe just really also the current situation shows us how quickly states can become fragile, right? I mean, we had the incidents in Burkina Faso just over the weekend or on, on Friday. Um, so it is very, for me, it is very interesting also to see how you, how the um, uh, German Ministry of Foreign Affairs aligns with BMZ, with the Ministry of Health, etc. I don't, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Sauter, your house is really uh, involved in a lot of initiatives putting yeah, health security on your agenda. I don't know if you also want to have a, a reaction before we give um, the floor to the, to the people who are attending, if you want to also comment from your side a bit on what has been said. Thanks a lot. Um, let me just say two things. First of all, um, this discussion is showing very vividly that this can only work as a team effort. All hands need to be on deck. And um, I think this group shows this in quite a marvelous manner. None of us could have been successful if it weren't a team effort. At the same time, this is my second point, the points that 
friends and colleagues around this virtual table have been making must make us continue to think how we can become better. I was just scribbling along as um, I was listening to all of you and I came up with four eyes. The first eye is innovation. We need to continue to be innovative. We need to come up with innovative and pragmatic solutions. For example, um, as we found them in the case of Cote d'Ivoire when we were um, finding out with partners there in the situation that buying motorcycle would be the right thing to do. We wouldn't have come up with that here in Berlin. Secondly, um, uh, inclusion. We need to work together with a variety of actors, including non-traditional partners youth groups and NGOs, and those who can best help us fix the problems that we have identified. And then thirdly, we must also continue to um, invest. We must invest in very concrete ways in cold chain logistics, in the training of healthcare workers, in the improvement of health systems, but we must also invest um, in a political sense in the relationships that bring us together in the networks that we can work with in our endeavors. Unfortunately, I didn't come up with a word starting with I to um, um, underpin my fourth and last point. So forgive me the stupid joke. I um, uh, would like to call it buy in. At least the in begins with an I. We continue to need political buy in. Buy in. This only works if it remains high on our agendas. We are now in a phase of the pandemic in which the pandemic is not yet over, yet people are starting to believe that other things have become more important. It's, I believe, one of the most important parts of our responsibility to make sure that the buy-in of the political leaderships, but also of everybody else involved, continues to be there. Thank you very much. I mean, that shows really, I think, a very huge commitment um, from the German side towards these principles in general, principles of partnership, alignment, and then, yeah, well, the three or the four eyes, um, but let's call it the four eyes principle. That's very good. Um, I would like to open a bit the floor and introduce um, Dr. Mainul Hassan, who would also contribute with one um, additional, yeah, Context description, he is a medical doctor and a, sp a specialized in epidemiology, has more than 25 years of experience with UNICEF, WHO, Save the Children, etc. in Southeast Asia and African countries, um, and has especially been um, in public health programs on immunization and vaccine preventable disease surveillance, but also on a lot on maternal and child health, communicable diseases, etc., and is with us from Cox Bazaar in Bangladesh. So, in a very specific context and situation. So, we would like to ask you, Dr. Hassan, this experience, which has been shared from the different yeah, panelists and from the different sites, um, how how does it differ from maybe from yours? Uh, because we are here to learn. So what can you tell us? What are the specific challenges uh, from your practical experience in Cox Bazaar? Thank you. Inke, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to you all. And uh, you already mentioned there's working in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, and in, you know, in the Cox's Bazaar, we have uh, host community people. And at the same time, we have an influx of Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. And we are providing support to uh, these uh, Rohingya refugees. It's around 1 million people are here uh, from Myanmar. And uh, if I give some sorts of context of that, you know, what the situation is working, you know, these uh, Rohingya refugees, uh, they have a very, uh, you know, low immunization, uh, you know, coverage. And when they come back to Bangladesh, we have faced a lot of vaccine preventable disease outbreak. 
So uh, from the very beginning, we have to provide, you know, uh, um, OCV campaign. We have to give up uh, OPV, uh, you know, we have to give uh, OPV campaign, etc. MR campaign, pentavalent vaccine, we have to give, and the diphtheria outbreak was there, we have to give. So we have a lot of experiences of that, but still, you know, uh, when the COVID comes, that actually really, really challenging for us. Initially, uh, it was a hesitancy and we do not know what to do. We face a lot of problems and uh, initially we face a trouble of getting vaccine because when you get the vaccine, government of Bangladesh gives priority to the host communities and the national people. So initially we did not get vaccine. So it was a big challenge for us to get vaccine because, you know, we start even when we get first vaccination, we started, we started only above 55 years age group. So we get some vaccine, the gradually the vaccine was more, and then we have to run the program in a phase wise fashion. So we first, uh, and it was in a Cox's weather, uh, we have to run this program as a campaign mode. So we are the three phases, we have to complete the vaccination program here, COVID vaccination. So first we uh, provided vaccine, more than 55 years age group, then and and we started it, it, it's a, it's a, um, around uh, it's a, we started uh, in august but when the national program is started uh, far before so there is the gaps of the timing so we got vaccine later and then we started in uh, uh, august and we started in a phase wise uh, fashion first phase was more than 55 years then uh, we started on second phase and it was in a uh, um, Mm, it, it's in a December and it was more than 50, uh, 18 years old age group. And then after that, we also got a third phase. It is more than 12 years and it is on June 2022. Uh, so actually, we st the difference between here was that we, we started the campaign in a phase wise fashion in a campaign mode. But at the national level, they have a fixed site and they provided vaccine and they have, you know, uh, almost every day there are vaccination program. But in camp mode, we have to have some certain days. The first, first uh, for uh, more than 55 years, we run the vaccination campaign for seven days. Then for 18 years, we have to run the vaccination campaign for 20 days. Then for 12 to 7 years, again, we have to run for the 20 days. So this way, there's a difference uh, between these two areas and we have to run this program in the uh, uh, vaccination campaign for the Rohingya refugees. And as we have some experiences, so we had some, uh, you know, positive things that we had detailed micro planning for that. So the detailed micro planning help us who are the people, who are they are. And we also have a detailed micro planning for the logistics. And we have to make a detailed plan for that vaccine and logistic transportation plan. And at the same time, we have to have more communication campaign. Our involvement of the majis, I mean, for the local leaders, the religious leaders, and also different age groups of people. And we also have some involvement of the lot of other organizations. It's not only one organization. Under the health sector, we have a lot of NGOs working here, even organizations working, and at the same time, government. So they have a good collaboration of all the organizations that really help us and really help us to, within a very short time when the vaccine was available, we are actually able to come up with the you know vaccination coverage. Initially, there's a, some sorts of frustration was there. We are not getting vaccine, but when we got the vaccine, we we really really did a tremendous job, and we uh, it was uh, you know on the first phase we, our coverage was uh, uh, around. Uh, 90 percent and the second person also is an uh, you know um, uh, 83 percent of the second phase uh, second dose and also in the third phase it was 89 percent on an average our coverage is more than 12 years is for the first round it is uh, first first dose it is 96 percent second dose it is 92 percent it was really really good in that sense that is all the uh, you know partners supported and particularly we can say that is uh, some organization for UNICEF, we have a communication and uh, they call the C4D team, uh, communication development. Now we are calling the social and behavioral change communication team. They work hard. And also we have a UNICEF organizations. They have community health workers. They also work hard, visited house to house, motivating people. And also we have a lot of other organizations those working in the local level. They have contributed a lot. At the same time, we have a, a detail of their targeting. 
So we have a make uh, our digitalization systems. We have a registration of the, all the people because they are coming to the, you know, taking the food and nutrition and these sorts of things. So we have a, you know, registration systems and we take the support. So we have a detail uh, targeting was there and we have vaccinated and put it in the, you know, our registration system. So we really know who have taken vaccination, who have not taken vaccination. So that really help us to uh, give the coverage. And then who are not taking vaccination, again, we have given round to round, you know, uh, to them and to bring out to them. We did a mop up to find out the unvaccinated people. So that's really help us. It's really, really. And these type of things really, really happen because when you get the vaccine with the support of German A grant and also the last miles initiatives, so really, really, we thank uh, uh, that uh, it was really possible for us and we are happy that is we are able to provide support for the women and children uh, of you know Rohingya refugees and Bangladesh with this support. Thank you. Well, thank yes. Th thank you very much. Uh, we can imagine um, that this has been quite tough over the time, but I think if you talk about 90% of vaccination rates, that of course I think a dream for some other countries. But I, I have heard that there are also some. Of course, the rates are much higher because you have a targeted also place and sites. But I've also heard that it's about alignment of uh, the. The people and the organization to intervene about and about the targeted approach, right? Which is something which we took also from the from the other presenters. Um, maybe just before I open the floor also to questions to everybody, I would like to say there are some, as you might have seen in the chat, there are some people who have also confirmed from their side that uh, that they say the last mile initiative has really contributed to the situation, to improving the situation on the ground and reaching the last mile about awareness um, and improving vaccine uptake. Um, so there's one very interesting question and I was also thinking about, you were talking also, uh, Dr. Hassan, you were also talking about digitalization and tools, digital tools, registration, etc. And there is a question also about, um, one thing is, one question would be about how do we, I mean, how do we ensure that we get the data? Because we talk about we have reached a certain percentage. Um, to which extent, maybe Ted, you can also say something about that is also investment into yeah, digital tools in order to improve data collection there. And maybe that as a first question, and then I take the ones from the chat. Ted, over to you, please. Uh, uh, gladly. Um, a, a big part of the effort, and I think part of the legacy of COVID-19 vaccination has been both to strengthen cold chain, but also to increase investments in health management information system. And what's been key is indeed the digitalization. Uh, so to move from a manual system uh, and get that as decentralized as possible to a digital uh, system. Uh, many countries don't have a digital country, including in the OECD DAC countries that tracks vaccination uh, among populations. And in this case, you also need to factor in that you need additional information. So age, uh, 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 comorbidities, in order to do the kind of targeting that is necessary to reach the most vulnerable. Um, and so there's been significant investments specifically by the World Health Organization, but also by organizations like UNICEF, the World Bank, Gavi and others to uh, provide both the hardware, the, the, the mobile phones, the tablets, to be able to do this digitalization and, and tie it to the uh, health management information system and specifically the immunization uh, um, uh, module of the health management information system. So, I mean, I, you know, the training, the, 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 the uh, equipping of the health workers, all that is part of the uh, exercise. Uh, even when that's not possible, uh, using mobile phones and, and WhatsApp or text messages is a first step in that direction. Uh, and, and again, I think one of the important legacies of this response has been to try to strengthen these um, uh, systems that will benefit the rest of primary health care. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I would like to hint to a very interesting question um, to all of you panelists, which has to do yeah, with digitalization. So um, Mr. Leopold Reif has asked from Berlin, has asked um, or has mentioned that there is a lot of fake news and misinformation also 
going through the social media and uh, a lot of people are using mobile phones in Africa, etc., mobile networks, um, and so are also affected by fake news about COVID and vaccination. Um, so what in your view could be a successful strategy to fight vaccine hesitancy online? And I remember also that there was a recently, um, and this was supported by the German uh, Ministry of Economic Development and, and Cooperation, was an, a contest against Corona where there were questions to be answered and a lot of fake news dismantled uh, in such a thing. And it was an online game and questionnaire. So, so how do you see this? fighting vaccine hesitancy and using online media for that. Um, just over to, to, yeah, to the panel. This is a question to the entire panel. May, may I replay? Uh, yes, okay. please. Th thank you. Uh, we developed some activity on social listening and addressing the rumors uh, with the support of uh, UNICEF. We have a, this uh, uh, specialized uh, communication and uh, communicating technical as expertise who listen the rumors on social and address uh, it by digitally or and also by IC material around uh, around the health facility and around the city. One of the main issues in Somalia was the infertility uh, that uh, COVID-19 will uh, cause uh, and we, we simply addressed and talking and also during Ramadan was vaccinating or not vaccinating during Ramadan, we engaged national Islamic uh, authority we have for you that works with the government who during uh, uh, Friday ceremony communicate that there is no contraindication and has uh, developed fatwa uh, that the people can get vaccination during uh, fasting period or during Ramadan. Um, that's the way we usually address the rumors on uh, social media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, there is uh, Ted also who raised his hand. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, in 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 uh, Tanzania, uh, we had a, a an opportunity uh, to interact with a number of, if you will, local celebrities, people who are influencers in society. Uh, and they were really able to take on the information, get vaccinated publicly, speak to the people that follow them on, on their social media feeds, and really get the message across that this was a safe vaccine and they were taking the step to get vaccinated. In, in DR Congo, 60% of the health system is run by different you know, Christian and, and Muslim uh, religious groups. And uh, to have bishops, imams as... Dr. Farah have said, use their social media platforms to get the right information out there has been key. Uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, so important. You need to get voices that are trusted by individuals uh, to counter what is out there in terms of in misinformation and, and, and figure out who exactly is trusted um, uh, in order to get the maximum impact. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, yeah. Kula Makina, you also had uh, had a contribution, right? Yes, um, similar to what Tata said, um, in our area, we actually find ambassadors slash champions that we use that are trusted by the communities. Because if I'm going to go into a community, I am not known and I'm introducing something, it's going to create a lot of um, mishaps. So we go around and find somebody that is trusted in the community. Uh, community leader or even somebody who works at the local clinic to make sure they are the voice for the campaign and now and then we also post on our Facebook page educating people about the vaccine have videos where people are saying they've got vaccinated they are okay because there were rumors that you get vaccinated you die the following day so we had to deal with those such rumors as well thank you yes thank you very much um, there is one question from the audience um, to ask about the zero rates which should be negotiated with mobile service providers in order to yeah, facilitate educational uh, health education online. So have like no educational fields for online yeah, courses and information. Are there any, is there any experience from countries where this has been applied and is there a willingness or ideas about that? C 
seems not to be the case at the moment. Um, there were there are two other questions I would like to raise. One is talking about um, yeah about the let's say the, the cross sector topic that there is not only the health sector involved but also of course the education sector and that um, there is a comment from uh, Ali Abdurrahman from GIZ to say um, that uh, he has been observing trainers at TVET and universities lacking about an update on vaccine and vaccination because you could use these sources. I, th I think, Kula uh, you have mentioned that you have used a lot of yeah, university people, etc., to uh, hand out information. Um, but they say, Please tell us your experience around that because it seems not yet really that there is a targeted um, integration of TVET and university yeah, staff to also bring over the information. How, how does it look like in your countries? Um, honestly speaking, with the TVET, um, as much as we have vaccinated about 200 uh, young people in the TVET, but they've got more than 10,000. Uh, people in the TVET. So the student uh, council, if I can call it, they're a bit resistant to it. Um, we are still going to have another session with them where we educate them, have a workshop one on one with them so that they can understand the importance of the vaccine. Our first encounter, it was a bit of a resistant. So we had to actually find our own champions within the TVET to get students to come vaccinate. So uh, the reception was not quite well. Hence, we've got a follow-up session with them so that we can educate them from the management level as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any experience in Somalia, Dr. Ahmed? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Somalia uh, has also the lower rate of uh, routine immunization. And one of, uh, of the routes who are the not well trained of the health staffs on vaccine and vaccination. We requested, we did some training and, uh, and, um, and workshop at the university, level, university student, and we request to be included in the curriculum, uh, national curriculum for all health workers, doctors, nurses, and midwives, uh, uh, a chapter talking about the vaccine, what they are composed, how they work, and how they can save lives. Uh, because the more we educate the health staff or the future generation, I think more uh, we can uh, uh, engage our community on taking vaccination. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's also a matter of competing needs, right? <laughs> Uh, th there was one question which has already somehow been answered in the chat, but um, the question was about the TRIPS waiver. If that would have not been a much needed measure in global distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, but I think we have discussed that it's not anymore about availability and distribution, but it's more about reaching the last mile um, because the access is in principle there and the way we would not have any impact on really the vaccination coverage uh, in remote areas. But I give the floor um, to others in the panel to respond to that. Um, I see Ted's hand, please. Sorry to come in uh, again, Inka, but I think this is an important point. Uh, look, it is true that act that availability is no longer an issue now but i do think that one of the one of the lessons of this pandemic response is that we need to uh, decentralize uh, manufacturing so that there's more manufacturing capacity in africa and, and asia uh, and we need to address issues of technology transfer uh, and intellectual property it's less an issue of intellectual property than it is an issue of technology transfer and, and you know as we're continuing to respond to COVID, but also preparing for the next pandemic, there's two or three issues we need to do better, and this is one of them. Um, so I think the question is very much uh, relevant, uh, and, and we both need to look at the issue of manufacturing, but also at the issue of, of uh, technology transfer, uh, so that we have more equitable access earlier on the next time around. Thank you very much. I see also Mr. Meyer's hand, and we know also that Germany is yeah, heavily investing into creating manufacturing 
competencies and capacities in Africa. But please, Mr. Meyer. Yes, to make it uh, very short, just to add what Ted uh, already said. Um, first of all, um, with the imagine uh, patent pool, we have already um, um, uh, a better solution than we had at the beginning of um, the uh, pandemic. And secondly, um, I would like to stress the point that, first of all, we need much more local um, vaccine production. That means especially vaccine production on the African uh, continent. We have several examples where countries are already on the way uh, from Germany, from the German government. We support this with um, half a billion uh, euros. Um, but we have to see that a building a sustainable vaccine production means to establish a very comprehensive uh, ecosystem around um, the uh, production. That means means ownership by the countries. That means good regulation. Um, that means uh, an ecosystem around the academia. Um, and that means um, close uh, cooperation on the continent. Therefore, we are very happy that the African Union with the CDC took responsibility. We support this and we just formed um, uh, another task force team to support the African Union to build up um, the uh, vaccine production. So talking about waiver is, uh, is one question, but the bigger question and the uh, more complicated answer is building um, a working and sustainable ecosystem around uh, production. We need that and we support that. Over. Thank you very much. Um, we are, yeah, we are slowly coming to an end of our very interesting discussion. So thanks a lot for your questions and for your, yeah, for your contributions. I would like to give the floor just to uh, Kuluma Kena, Dr. Ahmed, and Ted to give maybe share one recommendation um, you would have in order to yeah, make the last mile initiative uh, a much broader success than now. What would that be? So over to each of you um, to just give one recommendation. Um, Polo, do you want to, yeah, please start? Um, well, first I would like to thank um, uh, the Germans Last Mile Initiative and also the UK group for getting us involved in the project. And our recommendation mainly, it's more of inclusiveness, you know, to get the CBOs involved in the planning and strategy uh, strategy of this um, kind of uh, initiatives so that we can put uh, things in order before we go into communities. And the time frame as well, if we can have, uh, you know, at least a time frame to, con to have consultative meetings with the key stakeholders that will ensure the success of the projects. Thank you. Thank you, Kolo. Um, Dr. Ahmed? Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, one of my requests is to, to expand the expansion of the cold chain system. As I mentioned, our national cold chain is in Nairobi. Uh, to reach the last mile, we need uh, somehow add, uh, add other cold chains. And the second, we have to find an uh, integrated package of health, basic health service to deliver these communities in hard to reach area. Not only think about immunization, but all basic health service and resilience of primary health care. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Um, Ted, do you have a recommendation? Thank you. Um, the, the first thing I want to say is that the COVID-19 pandemic is not over and we need to stay the course on COVID-19 vaccine delivery, supporting the countries that didn't have this opportunity in 2021. So let's keep working on that together. But the recommendation I want to focus on is the, the following one. One of the legacies of this pandemic response needs to be to strengthen community health services. And I'm proposing that countries and partners uh, get together in early 2023 and have a summit to look at how we can support select countries to strengthen community health workers and pay and protect frontline community health workers. Germany has been such a leader in this response through the G7, through its last mile delivery initiative. It would be great if Germany could also be a champion of this community health system strengthening exercise. Thank you. 
thank you for this word addressing also Dr. Sauter and Mr. Meyer. Um, do you want to also just comment on what are your main takeaways and then what are the next steps for both of your ministries? Yeah, thanks a lot for that opportunity. I think that a lot of very good points have been made. I would like to take the opportunity here to broaden our perspective beyond the last mile initiative. And I would say that um, beyond what Ted and colleagues have just been mentioning, three points um, should be at the center of our attention. First of all, the last mile initiative should go on until we have um, delivered here. And as we have seen, there is a lot that we have been able to achieve together and there's a lot that we still need to do so let's do it secondly as federal foreign government we will continue to work on vaccine donations let's not forget the pandemic is continuing to evolve so are vaccines the new um, uh, mrna vaccines are now entering the market there will be a demand for these vaccines in many parts of the world. We will be in a different phase of the pandemic. Therefore, we are making sure here in Berlin that we will be able to deliver vaccines and vaccinations. And my last point is, I was saying in the beginning, I am looking at this as a diplomat. And as diplomats, I think we must now make sure together with our colleagues in the ministries of health all over the globe that we take the right lessons home from the pandemic. And one of the key mess mess lessons will be that we make sure that next time we are prepared. We are at least better prepared than we were when COVID-19 kicked in. The pandemic prevention preparedness and response um, uh, work that is ongoing right now is very important. And the negotiations that we have entered into in Geneva should be at the center of our attention. This is really a great opportunity to get it right for everybody. I personally believe that this is um, an endeavor, a diplomatic and a healthcare endeavor that is quite well comparable to what we are doing in terms of the protection of the climate in the framework of the Paris Agreement. And um, we should all in our different positions do all that we can to make sure that this becomes a success. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this really great commitment. We hear from you. Um, maybe I give also Mr. Meyer the word, please. Yes, just uh, a few things to add. First of all, if um, there were any doubt uh, whether it makes sense um, to start the last mile initiative, this panel just proved uh, that it made a lot of sense. and. Um, Therefore, thank you very much. All of you who are uh, on the ground and who are tailoring um, uh, all the measures uh, on the ground. Thank you very much. That's uh, of great uh, help. And I learned uh, a lot. Second, um, um, let's keep in mind that we have to overcome the pandemic. Pandem pandemic. We are still not over with it. And therefore, we should be aware that even new international uh, health measures uh, should be started if the pandemic is um, um, speeding up uh, again. The next one is that um, we should use um, the momentum. Um, that's uh, what I also um, uh, try to uh, stress. Um, the momentum means that um, we have to make societies and people resilient to overcome um, the uh, current and future pandemics with uh, social security and healthcare systems. That's, uh, that should be in the center of uh, our politics for the next decades. And we need to have a lot of partners around the world and the ownership in the countries. Um, and um, that means also to learn from the mistakes we made during this pandemic. Uh, and therefore, 
Uh, I still see this momentum. Uh, I'm not pessimistic, but the window is closing uh, soon. And therefore, the German government is dedicated um, to give uh, a, a, a bit more push on this topic. And um, that's also another uh, promise we can give in this uh, panel for the uh, entire government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is really very encouraging because we are yeah, looking at windows closing, etc. But thanks a lot for confirming your huge commitment towards health, towards the last mile, towards vaccination, but in general about partnerships and that health remains high on the agenda. Um, yes, um, before everybody leaves, uh, I would just like to announce um, that there is a short survey we would like you to participate in because we are always trying to improve our sessions, our panels, etc. So please don't leave all the participants uh, before that is the case. Um, we think that there is a lot of food for thought for further discussions. We would really like as a Global Health Hub Germany also to continue this discussion. There will be follow-up sessions. There will be communication between different participants etc and we all invite you there are lots of communities and groups um, with the global health of germany also to engage with and further think about the solutions exchange on lessons learned and best practices um, and i would also like to take the opportunity to announce you have maybe seen that already the launch of the paper towards a global health architecture that works for all which is um, something which has been elaborated with different partners. Uh, it's exactly about the multilateralism, look at the architecture and global health, what we need, what we think. There were a lot of ideas also and a lot of um, contributions in this panel as well. So that's a paper which has been uh, published and we are looking forward also to discussion about it. Um, so um, there were yeah there were five different stakeholder groups uh, who discussed what must change and how Germany can contribute to that global health architecture. And with Germany being at the presidency of the G7, we have heard now also that we have very loud voices for health, for multilateralism, and yeah, in general for improving health and well-being for all. So I thank you a lot. It has been a really very interesting discussion. It's a pity that time went so fast. I think there are lots of points we could deepen in, but, but thanks a lot for your time, especially for the panelists, for the interesting insights from the ground, for the interest of the ministries to really hear those voices and for the interesting questions from the audience. So yes, I wish you all, yeah, first of all, good health, uh, that we all, go well through the pandemic, which has not yet ended, as you mentioned, and a lots of courage to all of you who work in difficult contexts. We really admire your engagement and commitment. And as you also said, everybody in his or her position should do his or her best in order to contribute to that goal. So wishing you a very nice day and thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. Bye.